This week's episode of the Moonlight Graham Show is brought to you by The People's Company. That's right, they are back as a sponsor because so often I hear from farmers throughout Iowa and throughout the Midwest who are listening to the podcast while they are planting, while they are harvesting. They're in their tractors, they're in their combines, which makes The People's Company a perfect partner for the Moonlight Graham Show here. As you guys probably well know, The People's Company is based in West Des Moines, Iowa, but they've really grown to be one of the nation's leading providers in land brokerage, land management, land appraisal and investment services. These guys, and I know Andrew Zelmer and Matt Adams over there at the People's Company, these guys live and breathe farmland, farm management, and they know that industry better than anybody. So if you're looking to buy a farm, sell a farm, having an auction coming up, call the People's Company. They are the best in the business. Check them out at peoplescompany.com. This is the Moonlight Graham Show, a freewheeling conversation with the role players, the underdogs, and guys with flat out great stories in sports. Hello and welcome back to the Moonlight Graham Show. Once again, I am your host, Tim Flattery, and this week on the podcast, we are talking about two sport athletes. Since the Michael Jordan documentary came out, there's been a lot of talk on social media about multi-sport athletes because, of course, Michael Jordan played basketball, played baseball. During that era in the 90s, you had Deion Sanders, you had Bo Jackson. And so our Moonlighter this week also played two professional sports. And his name? is Danon Hughes. Danon Hughes was originally from New Jersey, right outside of New York City, but came all the way to Iowa City for college. And while at the University of Iowa, Danon Hughes played both basketball, or excuse me, played both baseball and football. The guy played for Dwayne Banks on the baseball field and for, of course, legendary coach Hayden Fry on the football field. He ended up being drafted in the third round as a baseball player, played two seasons of professional baseball in the Brewers minor league system and then was drafted in the sixth round of the NFL draft by the Kansas City Chiefs and played six years for the Chiefs and he was on some of those really great Kansas City Chiefs teams in the early to mid 90s right when Joe Montana and Marcus Allen if you guys remember those teams when they came to the Chiefs in the 90s Dane and Hughes came in right with them so Dane and Hughes played for Marty Schottenheimer and played in the playoffs for four different playoff teams for those Kansas City Chiefs years. Ended up having 46 career receptions in the NFL and had a really nice career. Had, um, I believe, four touchdown catches in the NFL as well. And so we caught up with Danon Hughes. The guy's now working in banking, also works for the Big Ten Network, broadcasting for both football and baseball games. Really a sharp guy, smart guy. And it was fun to get him here on the Moonlight Graham Show. I think he's a great podcast guest, especially while we're talking about two sport athletes right now. So I think you guys are really going to love this episode. And if you like what we're doing here on the Moonlight Graham Show, make sure to subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcast, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify. Subscribe to the Moonlight Graham Show and leave us a five-star review. You can also follow the show on social media, Twitter. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. We love hearing from you guys each and every week. So enjoy this episode with Moonlighter, Danon Hughes. But before we get to our interview, I know it's a tough time right now and a lot of people are out of work. So I wanted to talk about a new sponsor we have have on the show, buildiowa.org. Because the construction industry, especially throughout the Midwest, is still up and running and hiring. So I was just on this website, buildiowa.org, and what really stood out to me was how much the professional men and women in this industry make. Did you know that professional estimators on average make between sixty-two dollars and $80,000 a year? How about crane operators? What a cool job that is. They make between sixty and seventy grand a year on average. The other great part about buildiowa.org is how they spell out exactly how you can get started in the 27 different careers they have listed on the website. They have active resources to companies that are training and hiring. That's right, hiring right now. We know some of you moonlighters are looking for a career change or perhaps you've been impacted by this pandemic. If that's you, head on over to buildiowa.org 
NoahNoah.org and check out the incredible careers available right now in the construction industry. There's also a link to a job board that lists active jobs that are open right now. The good people at Build Iowa are here to help and they want to make you aware that there are rewarding career options available for you. And for those of you on social media, check them out. You can find them Build Iowa on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. That's right, buildiowa.org. Dane, and as I'm looking through, you know, your stats, you know, I'm seeing a couple of years of, of minor league baseball. And then, of course, you had a good run with the Chiefs there in the 90s. But my big question that jumped off the page to me was, is there anything in baseball that had the same level of, of excitement as a packed football stadium? Ooh, um, wow. I don't know if it's the same level of excitement, but I think there's a, there's a similar level of intensity and, and competition. Uh, for me, I always think, you know, I always teach the kids that I've coached and I've always taken the mindset of, you know, in football, it's you versus another guy. And, you know, there's obviously, whether it's testosterone, adrenaline, whatever else, there's always some, there's a factor in that that uh, builds intensity. But in base, I mean, the ball leaves the pitcher's hand, it's you versus the ball. If it's, you know, once it leaves the bat, it's you versus the ball on defense. And um, I always kind of had the same kind of mindset that there was somebody out there trying to beat me. And... Um, I couldn't let it happen. So whether it was with a ball or with a shoulder pad, you know, I just kept that same mindset. So for me, the intensity and the adrenaline was the same. Excitement, there's nothing like Arrowhead Stadium, so that's probably pretty tough. (laughs) (laughs) Right, right. Yeah, I got to think that playing like in Helena, Montana is not the most (laughs) exciting place to start a professional baseball career. No, nah, it, 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 actually, it was fun. I wouldn't say exciting because, uh, you know, compared to Dwayne Banks Field, Bank Stadium, it, you know, the excitement level is not as high, but it was a great experience, um, something I will never forget. I wouldn't trade for anything to play up there in, in that league and travel around to Salt Lake City and to Butte, Montana, and then up into Canada and Lethbridge and Medicine Hat and have that experience. You know, that's part of the country I would never see if I never played right. baseball. I mean, and so it was, it was a great experience and a fun time to just be a minor league player and the bus trips and all that jazz. So definitely different from football, <laughs> but it, it was still fun. You were a third round pick out of Iowa, which is pretty high in the baseball draft. Obviously, you know, being a third round pick in baseball, you know, considering there's like 50 rounds, there's not many third Mm -hmm. rounders. Even to this day, Iowa has not had many guys drafted that high. So what was, was there ever a a moment that you thought baseball might be the path for you? Uh, I initially, baseball is my first love. So I initially thought baseball was going to be my way. I wanted to play both sports for as long as possible. Um, but I always love baseball still do. It's still my favorite. And, um, you know, I, I, there's, it's still a record, I guess, if you want to call it a record that I'm the, I believe I'm still the highest player drafted out of Iowa since 1990 or 91. So, um, you know, they've had some pitchers and they've had some great players. I played with Cal Eldred and Tim Costo, who were both drafted, in the top of the first round um so we've had some some studs there and they you know rick heller has done an outstanding job uh with resurrecting that program over the last five six years um so there's going to be some talent that'll probably come along and break that record but uh it's been standing for a long time and i take a lot of pride in it because it was my favorite sport uh i always wondered if i would have been able to play that sport all year round where would I have been? Where would I have gotten to? Uh, I saw players that I played with in the minors get to the major league level. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, there's always a wonder, but there's not any regret. Um, baseball, you know, was near and dear to my heart. I coached some kids that play college and pro baseball now. And, you know, I, I was able to take a lot from my experience with Coach Banks and the Iowa baseball program and, and be able to utilize it, not just for my own pro experience, but some other kids as well 
What's up with the only two stolen bases when you're in your pro career? Man, they didn't really let me loose on the base pass <laughs> back then. I, they, they must have thought I was slow or something. I don't know. I, I mean, I actually, I think the my first summer, I had a, a hit streak of like 20-something games. I think the first 20-something games I played in, I got a hit. So I was on the base pass. I don't know. Uh, why I couldn't get to the next base, uh, but I had some wheels back then, so that that is kind of weird. <laughs> so, so you're a guy, you know, you're not a Midwesterner by you know by birth. You you came from New Jersey, and I gotta think that when you're getting recruited to the University of Iowa by Hayden Fry, who is you know I know he's a Texas guy, but he was really like a middle of America cowboy hat. And, and cowboy boots and just a different cat where I got to imagine that was maybe a culture shock for you coming from New Jersey. Definitely different. I think that was probably part of the draw. I mean, I had, I always tell the story. I, I had never seen cowboy boots in person. I had never <laughs> seen uh, a Southerner, you know, especially somebody from Texas in person. I mean, I grew up five minutes from New York city. Right. So I was, you know, that's all I saw was city people, city kids, you know, great Italian food and pizza. And, and so he came to my house with his cowboy boots on and his southern twang, and he just kind of wowed us. And the, the big decision, uh, it wasn't a huge decision for me to leave home. I kind of felt like I wanted to, to get away um, from Jersey and be on my own. It was mainly about being able to play baseball. And um, he came in my house. I, and and that's we put it on the table. Hey, if you're gonna let me play baseball, I'll come for a visit, and we can move on from there. And he promised it. And that's one of the things, one of the many things I can say about him uh, that was great. But the integrity factor in a day and age when recruiting is about sales and selling your program and selling kids on on dreams and maybe some falsehoods twisted in there, he had great integrity. He told me what I could do. He promised that I can do it. And he allowed a dream. So, uh, I'll be forever grateful for that experience. And, uh, the fun, the fun experience of him coming up into my high school in Jersey and into my house in Jersey with his cowboy boots. That was, we, we, we all got a kick out of that one too. <laughs> yeah. What did your buddies say when Hayden Fry's walk in the schools of your high school and everybody's saying like, who is this cowboy? Is this John Wayne or something? We had some Iowa Hawkeyes that had come from my high school in the past. A couple of my cousins years before me had came up there. Uh, Jerome Rowan was a fullback in the early eighties. Um, uh, and Dwayne Williams was a running back in the late seventies. He was up there. Actually, he came in with Andre Tippett. Okay. Yeah. So there were some guys that were there. So it wasn't unfamiliar around our high school. Uh, Joe Paterno would walk around Tom Osborne. Uh, we had some solid football players that came from that area. So it wasn't too uncommon to see some of those big iconic names walk in the hallways or watching out basketball games and, um, you know, kind of partaking of the recruiting process. So nobody noticed the cowboy boots, I guess, because I didn't get any <laughs> – nobody messed with me about it. What was those – what were the off-season demands like for baseball and football? Because you're playing, you know, in the Big Ten, right? And that's, that's no joke. That's major college football. That's major college baseball. You're obviously a big pro prospect. I got to imagine that – both coaches or scouts are are on you to be working on your craft for both sports in the off season. There had to be a lot of struggle in the overlap of that back in the day. Well, in college, the, the real cool thing about Coach Fry and that integrity I talked about and his promise was, uh, he said, Danon, if you're playing baseball, not sitting on the bench, if you're playing, you don't have to do football, which is wow. uncommon. Um, you know, unheard of. And so my freshman year, I redshirted in baseball. So I went through the entire spring football practice. Uh, I redshirted in football that fall. I was a redshirt freshman and I was a starting wide receiver. I started every game I played at Iowa in football. Every game I was eligible except one. And that game I went in on the second play. <laughs> so um, I started pretty much every game and 
So when football came around that spring, he said, okay, I went over. I, I, I didn't even show up to football. I went right over to the baseball locker room. Got my, I didn't know if I was supposed to do it that way or not, but I went over there and I started baseball practice and uh, never looked back. There was a cool piece done my redshirt freshman year where I played in the spring game. I think I had like four catches for a hundred and something yards. And they had a golf cart ready for me and they brought me over to the baseball diamond. We were playing Ohio state in a double header. And I played in the second game of a double header after the spring game wow. of football. So that was the zigzag. But after that, I never played spring football again for three years. I just totally committed to baseball. And um, I think that's what really helped me be better on the baseball field. And it also kind of helped me prioritize each sport when it was necessary and then put all put everything in. When the baseball season was over, I went to play summer baseball in uh, West Virginia one summer and went to football. All my workouts, all my conditioning everything was about football. So I was able to kind of compartmentalize each one and the coaches, coach Banks and coach Fry really helped me to, to stay structured that way. What was the tougher transition getting ready to, you know, going from baseball to running pass routes or going from football and having to hit a curveball? Uh, it was going from football to having to hit a curveball. I mean, we were, we were pretty solid back then. We had some really good pitchers. And so go and it, and obviously in Iowa, you're not going outside. So right. you're in the bubble, indoors, in hitting tunnels with pitchers 60 feet, six inches away. And there's really, you know, you kind of lose the perspective of the, you know, where you are on the field and being in the batter, batter's box uh, in tight quarters. And you're always, you know, I felt like I was always kind of retooling uh, my, my swing, my stance, my strides and so on. So I think the transition from football to baseball was more difficult. When, when baseball was done in the summer, I had already been running routes and weightlifting and doing a lot of that stuff already. So it was really just about putting on the equipment. Well, famously, you get drafted by the Kansas City Chiefs right right at a fun time of the Kansas City Chiefs history. You know, they just picked up Joe Montana in 1993. You come in right around that same time, and you come into a locker room in Kansas City with future Hall of Famer Joe Montana, Marcus Allen, Derek Thomas, you know, guys like Neil Smith. Like, these were kind of legendary Chiefs teams. What was entering that locker room as, you know, a two-sport guy essentially like for you as a you know a 23-year-old? Well, it, it was fun, obviously, a little bit intimidating, but they made it so comfortable. And Marty was the kind of coach that loved blue-collar guys. He loved, you know, he was kind of that type of player and coach. You know, the guys that, you know, wasn't really about where you were drafted. It was about the guys who were going to go in and work. And um, and so, you know, I, I actually came to the city on a broken foot. I broke my foot at the Hula Bowl. Uh, the all-star game and went through the combine didn't work out uh, two days before the draft they, they they said that my foot could heal without surgery and two days before the draft they I was called and quick enough you got to go get surgery and you better hurry up and get it done and we got to get a memo out to all 30 teams to let them know that you're healed so I literally in 48 hours between Monday and Thursday when the draft was on Thursday, I, was at, and I had to hurry up and get surgery in New York and then get a report out that the surgery went well and that I would be fully recovered. So it was a mad scramble to the draft. I actually didn't participate in, in mini camp. I was on some restriction in, in training camp. And, um, I just kind of caught their eye and I, and what kept me was the weirdest and funniest uh, part of it is what kept me sane and relaxed is I assumed that's how naive I was. I assumed that all draft picks made the team. <laughs> that was it. So I was, so when everybody else was scrambling and kind of on edge, trying to squeeze in, and get stuff done and see I our coaches, I was just relaxed and playing. I didn't worry about any of that. Cause I just assumed I, you know, I'll make the team. It's just a matter of 
if I'll play or not, if I'll be on the bench. So, um, you know, I look back years after that and like thought about how crazy I was, but it worked. So, <laughs> uh, you know, I got no, uh, no regrets that way, but it was a little bit uphill battle because of the foot injury. What was it like catching passes from Joe Montana? Insane. I mean, he's a, he, he was such a great dude. Uh, the one thing about playing with greatness is you don't want to be the one to screw things up. So, it's, so you wind up like focusing a little bit more uh, when the passes come your way. You don't want to be the guy that dropped Joe Montana's pass. Right. You don't want to be the guy that, that ran the wrong route when Joe was trying to throw you a pass. So uh, he'd be more of a student of the game because I didn't want to be the idiot to drop a pass or <laughs> to make a mistake with Joe Montana and Marcus Allen in the locker room. We all came in together. So they were traded for that same offseason that I was drafted. And then I was drafted with Will Shields, who is now in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, so that's right. He was the class of three Hall of Famers uh, that I got to be a part of in my first year with the Chiefs. That's incredible. And I know you've done a lot of work over the, over the years with helping out NFL draft picks and young professional athletes with handling their money and, and financial planning and, and being a professional and, and things of that like. Was there someone when you got into the NFL that took you under their wing? No, not really. <laughs> I mean, I'd love to say that there were some mentorship programs and and different things like that. There weren't. I had no clue about the transition, what to do, what not to do. Um, financially, you know, I had some money in my pocket because I got uh, a six-figure signing bonus with baseball. Um, but I was drafted in the seventh round in football, so I didn't get much of any money at all there. So uh, I just kind of learned along the line. There was a couple of times I'd ask some questions to, to teammates, uh, but a lot of times conversations don't really happen in the locker room. Mm -hmm. um, and so you kind of, you know, learn by fire and you learn by mistakes. And that's kind of what catapulted me or propelled me to when my career was over, that I was able to go back and mentor and teach and help guys understand finances that help them understand their credit scores, how important it is, how to buy a house. So I was able to utilize my my past experiences to kind of propel me to give back to the game and give back to younger guys because I kind of felt like I was a smart guy. And if I was smart, so-called smart, and I was making those dumb decisions, that's what kind of made me want to do that. How did you know when the right time to retire was? Because you, you retired pretty early at 28. Yeah, I had um, – Marty, Marty Schottenheimer and I had a real good relationship, and um, I knew what he expected from me, and uh, I knew what he wanted, and he knew what he was going to get from me. And he got fired after the 98 season, and I kind of felt like that was when my time was going to be up in Kansas City. I signed with the New Orleans Saints went down there for the entire off season and preseason. And uh, Mike, Mike Ditka, a crazy story, weird story sh uh, shows you the, some of the dysfunction that was going on down there in New Orleans. That was the year that they traded their entire draft. Ricky Williams. Ricky Williams. Yeah. I remember that. But the last, last week of the preseason, he nominated me as a captain of the team. Um, he, dubbed me one of the captains of the team, three captains, offense, defense, special teams, and I was the special teams captain. And then he cut me like a couple of days later, which didn't make any sense. I mean, we really didn't have any practice. We played one insignificant preseason game, and then he released me. So um, I kind of felt I came home, prayed with my wife about it. We had four kids at the time. Um, I didn't want to be one of those players that hung on and kept, continued to try to hang on and get in and get in and spend money and time and energy trying to do that. Uh, I kind of felt that peace after we prayed about it, that my, my career was good. Six years was good. And wow. was time to transition into a career and I was able to make the transition well and get into the banking world. And then broadcasting came along after that. So, it was a good transition. It was a peaceful transition. Probably could have played 
or uh, scrambled around to try to latch on somewhere for another one or two years, but at the time it wasn't worth it. So Dana, the way we end every episode of the Moonlight Graham show is with the five big questions. And the first question gotcha. is who is the all time, who is your all time favorite teammate? Ooh, in, in any sport, a college or pro? That's right. Ooh, man, that's a tough one. I've never had that question asked me. <laughs> uh, wow. Favorite teammate? I'd have to say Matt Rogers, Ooh. my quarterback at Iowa. Yeah. We were roommates, too. And, um, you know, all the great stuff that happened uh, at Iowa for me involved him at the quarterback position, and we're still close to this day. We still go on vacations together, so I'd say Matt Rogers. Oh, that's cool that you guys are still that tight after all these years because that's what, you know, 25 years ago now. Oh, well, you didn't have to say 25 <laughs> years, man. I mean, I'm still a young guy now. Yeah, You're well, a grandpa, yeah, we, Dana. We, You're we, a grandpa. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You're killing me. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, we still get together. There's a group of us. Jimmy Hartley, John Hartley, Matt Rogers, Paul, Alan Cross, Mike Saunders, John Derby, Cliff King. We all get together every year on a golf trip. That's cool. Probably the last 20 years. And um, so, yeah, those, those relationships are have been extended for life. You know, even some linemen mix in there with Mike Ferroni and, and Mike Devlin as well. So it, those, those are some cool people. So I, I put Rat up there, Matt Rogers up there. What's one moment that you have from your career that reminds you of everything that you love about sports? Um, my, and I don't know if this is one of your other questions, but uh, my greatest accomplishment, um, which kind of fits in line with that question. Hopefully I'm, I'm not ruining one of your other three, <laughs> but um, is I had a teammate, Mike Martin. He was a walk-on wide receiver from Des Moines. And if you look up his stats, he had one catch for one touchdown. And uh, I remember he was rotating in with me, and the play came in. It was his turn, and everybody assumed that I would just go in because I was the starting receiver and it was a play to me. And I remember clear as day pointing to him and saying, hey, it's your turn. Go get it. And to this day, he, it still gives me chills, but to this day, he, he, like, when I've seen him, he still, like, looks at me like, damn, thank you so much. Like, I did something for him. So, I guess, you know, the importance of the game, things being bigger than the game, is what I take from it. That there, there are things that wins and losses will never equate to. And when you try to do things right, and you do right by people, uh, good things will happen and memories, lifelong memories happen. That is so cool. I'm so glad you told that story. As I mentioned earlier, you know, we're all about the role players and the underdogs, and that is the ultimate, you know, role player underdog story right there for that guy to have one catch, one touchdown, and it still is a big memory of your career. I love that. Yep. It was, uh, I remember it was pro right, 79 slant. He ran the slant from the right side back of the end zone. He caught it for a touchdown. And uh, he was one year older than me, so I was a junior. That's probably my, my biggest accomplishment is that in that time when I could have been selfish, when you know selfish instincts could have taken over, that uh, I deferred the right way and, and made somebody's you know lifelong dream happen. So that's cool. Is there anything that nags at you from your career? <sighs> nags at me from my career? Um I wonder if if I would have committed to baseball, what would have happened? I mean, I was drafted with Derek Jeter and Jason Giambi and Jeff Hammonds and, you know, a lot of guys that were in the top first, second, third round. Not that I would have ever been to the been to the top like Jeter, but I just wonder yeah. if you know, if I would have if if that would have happened, if I'd have been able to commit to that. Um so I guess that would that would probably be it. Because there's a few games um, that I wish we would have won the Rose Bowl or, you know, we got, here's a trivia question. Um, who was the last college football bowl game tie? It was us, 1991. 
Uh, that's the last ever that will ever happen in a bowl game. You know, we had a tie versus BYU. So I wish, you know, those type of things where it's cool to have that kind of trivia, but it would have been better if we would have won. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, there's, there's some, you know, some of those that flow around every once in a while. Who's the best athlete you were ever on the field with? Dale Carter. Ooh, he was um, a chief. Yep. Dale Carter was the best defense, and I played against, um, and there's no diss towards Hall of Famers and great players, but I played against Dion. I played against um, uh, Green um, from the, the Redskins. Yeah, I played Green. against a lot. Daryl Green. I played against a lot of great defensive backs, but there's nobody that I played against like Dale Carter as far as athleticism, uh, energy. I never saw him breathe heavy. I never saw him out of breath. I never saw him tired, um, reckless. Uh, he played with chewing tobacco in his mouth instead of a mouthpiece. <laughs> uh, so yeah, by far he's probably the best, best defensive back and probably the best athlete I've played against. Wow. That's cool. I, I like the Dale Carter, uh, you know, nineties, nineties fans will love that one. Final question oh, yeah. then, Dana. Who is hey, and here I'll tell you what, here's another little tidbit. Dale Carter, he went to Ellsworth Community College up in Iowa. I didn't know that. Yeah. Because wasn't he a Florida <laughs> State guy too? No, he went to he went from junior college in Iowa to Tennessee. Oh my god. I gotta I like that. Man, you're you're full <laughs> of the fun facts today. That's good. All right, final question yeah. then, Dana. What's the best advice you've ever received? Um, hard work pays off always, always, no matter what you do, uh, you know, don't be outworked. And that's kind of what I modeled my career at is that, you know, there's people always throw around first in the, first in the office, last to leave. But, you know, I always felt like there's, I lost their games. Lost. There were times I lost in life, but I never got beat. And to me, the way you, when you get beat is when you get outworked. And so um, that's the best advice is that, you know, there were times when I grew up in the city where I didn't know if I was working out correctly. I didn't know. I didn't have programs. I didn't have, you know, weight, weight rooms and facilities. You just went and worked on what you, what you thought you were supposed to do. And that was in the early years. You go to work, get your lunch pail, and you go to work. So um, that kind of propelled me, not just on the field, but in life with my family, with my five kids. Um, hard work pays off always. So go to work. That's great. And well, hey, I, Dana, I really appreciate you taking the time to to do this for for the podcast here today. And I I should say I, I love the Rick Heller shout out. So I, I played for Heller at, at U and I um, before okay. he moved on to Iowa, and so I'm a huge Heller fan. And I just and all that that staff that he has there, you know, those are kind of all the guys that were at UNI when I was there. So I'm not a Hawkeye fan yeah. by trade, <laughs> but I cheer for the baseball team because those are my guys. Oh man, he's done an outstanding job, and all his all those guys are great dudes. I get a chance to spend time with them when I'm doing the Big Ten Network. Yep, during the season and at the Big Ten tournament up in uh, Omaha, and you know we'll have dinner, we'll hang out a little bit, talk in the dugout, and just uh, salt of the earth. Rick Heller and his whole staff. I mean, what he's done with that program has been phenomenal. So, yeah, yeah, he's awesome. It's so cool to see, and it's awesome to see like him have the resources and the administrative support, and you know, you knew mm-hmm. the success would follow it once he had that. Absolutely, and and those guys play for him, and he, he I mean, he does it as well as anybody I've ever seen. So, you know, obviously for the last several years, being the only Division One program in the state of Iowa. Yep with his abilities and to recruit and and judge talent i mean the sky's the limit absolutely well thanks again dana i really appreciate it man Stay okay, safe. Take care. No hey guys thanks once again to listening to today's episode of the moonlight graham show and even though i do most of the interviews here on the podcast there is a ton of work that happens behind the scenes that you guys don't see that make each episode possible so i got to give a shout out to the moonlight graham show team First of all, Brian Sandvig, our producer, 
Brian does all of the post-production work. And in real life, he's not just a podcast producer. He's also a real estate agent. So if you're looking to buy or sell a home down in the Kansas or Missouri areas, give Brian Sandvig a call. Next guy on that list is Brendan Gargano. Brendan does all of our design and artwork here on the podcast. He's one of the most talented artists I've ever met. And I love all of his work. If you need any help on the design side with logos or anything like that, give Brendan Gargano a call. The next guy on that list is Andy Flattery, my older brother. Andy, of course, has done some of the of the interviews here on the podcast. He also is a certified financial planner. He owns a business called Simple Wealth Planning. If you need any help in that area, check Andy Flattery out. And then, of course, the trusty co-host, Tom Griffin, and my younger brother, Neil Flattery. Those guys are just busy being husbands, being fathers, they're family men, but also they do a ton of work here on the show. So thanks again for listening. We really appreciate you guys subscribing and supporting the Moonlight Graham Show.